Welcome to another installment of A Dose of Truth. This is your snarky host, Dr. J. Michael Nyota, author, early L.A. crime historian, and biographer and grandson of Los Angeles godfather, Jack Dragon. Eager as ever to unsheathe the straight razor and shave away the fiction of mob folklore. So following the theme of A Dose of Truth, we will be donning the brass knuckles and going a few rounds with some well-established mythology. Zeus. Odin. The Tooth Fairy. Actually, it'll be more like challenging the best-selling mob authors in the genre and ever so gently taking a Louisville slugger to mafia rumor. I'm entering the ring with a heavyweight this time around, a man of questionable allegiances. In that corner, a feared individual known by many aliases, the most often uttered being Mr. Johnny Roselli. Okay, so Handsome Johnny is uh, the anti-hero persona typically pitted by crime authors as the suave emissary of Chicago. A lot of folks believe he was decisively and methodically dispatched to Los Angeles by the infamous Al Capone in the mid-1920s to carve out a piece of Hollywood for the Chicago outfit. Well, in this segment of A Dose of Truth, I'm merely tackling the belief that Roselli belonged to the Chicago outfit before he joined the Los Angeles Brigade. This is by far the most widely accepted view of Roselli's beginnings, and largely because the theory has been posed in a number of books, some of them bestsellers in the genre. Unafraid of going up against the heavies, I'm gonna flip on a light switch so we can investigate all these scary monsters hiding under the bed. <coughs> all right, so there are two biographies out on Johnny Roselli. Lee Server saw print in 2018. Serve as a biographer, he covered Robert Mitchum and Ava Gardner's life before ever began investigating Johnny. Nearly 30 years before he wrote Handsome Johnny, Charles Rapley and Ed Becker released their exclusive on Johnny's life. And that was All American Mafioso, published in 1991. That book has long been a go-to for crime writers. Briefly on that pair. All American was Rapley's first book. The USC graduate, a journalist and editor for the LA Weekly, he wouldn't write another book for 15 years. And All American is actually his only true crime title. The research end of the work likely came from his writing partner, Ed Becker, a former Las Vegas private investigator. So Becker was interviewed by Ed Reed for his 1969 Grim Reapers and by Judith Moore in what became her posthumously released a bad, bad boy, covering the life of San Diego hitman Frank Bomp and Sierra. That's a bad, now, bad boy. While each biography is well written, insightful, and entertaining, it should be noted that these works are guilty of perpetuating several commonly held misconceptions, and they even give birth to a few new taller tales. <laughs> In the defense of the earlier attempt, now Rapley and Becker did their legwork in an era devoid of the internet. Also, they didn't have access to Johnny Roselli's FBI files, which are now available to the peasants of the world, aka you and I and the rest of the gen pop. That being said, Lee Server does not get the same level of leniency. Looks like I'm gonna have to hit him with the soup, Nazi. I'm for you. All right. So even though Johnny Roselli's federal files are now available online, there's actually two versions. Two, the more accurate depiction wasn't drafted until the 1960s. Some of the material from the older files containing pieces of his fabricated identity have mistakenly been used by crime writers. Uh -oh. In his 30 illegal years to the strip, which is a delightful expose on Las Vegas, author Bill Friedman made the big blunder. He very wrongly stated, after his parents died in his mid-teens, he, that being Johnny Roselli, moved to Chicago. But a year later, persistent tuberculosis drove him to the warmer climate of Los Angeles. 
So the older Files clan Roselli was born in Chicago and came to LA when he was about 15. But the updated Files reveal he was born in Italy, grew up in Boston, left at the age of 17 to evade jail time, and stopped off in Chicago briefly before landing in Los Angeles. The feds learned Johnny's true identity of Filippo Sacco in the second half of the 60s. The Phoebes cornered Johnny at Rodeo Drive in Brighton way out in Beverly Hills. Midday, sun out, they pulled their ride to the curb and identified themselves, boasting, Hey Johnny, we know who you are. You feel like being deported? And they even brought along a copy of his birth certificate and a picture of him and his mother out in Boston when he was just a kid. So, Johnny keeps a straight face, right? Cool cat under pressure. Doesn't even want to see what they've got in the envelope. Not interested. Instead, he mouths, go see my attorney. I don't know what you're talking about. So Johnny's friend going back to the mid-30s, Salvatore Piscopo. That's who dimed him out. Most know him as Dago Louie. The cops also had his alias of Louie Murley. Just a heavy set guy, dressed well, lived out in Fairfax. He was made in the same ceremony as Jimmy the Weasel in 1947. But he'd been around the LA's bookmaking scene a hell of a lot longer, and he actually introduced the Weasel to Johnny Roselli and the Dragnus. Dinged by the tax man, Dago Louie began cooperating with the feds around 1963. That gave agents a starting point into Roselli's true criminal background. They learned his true name of Filippo Sacco, where he was born, where he grew up, and they took it from there. Here's what they uncovered. He was born in Italy in 1905, came to Boston as a kid, attended school there until November of 1917, dropped out at the age of 12, and maintained odd jobs in and around the city. So numerous crime writers have given their end of Johnny's misdeeds in Boston after he dropped out of school, but the earlier authors didn't have access to Johnny's federal files. The updated version reveals that in 1922, convict, under name Philip Sacco, was arrested in Boston, Mass., on a charge of selling heroin, and in 1923, also in Boston, on a charge of larceny. In each instance, the 17-year-old was released on bond, but in 1923, prior to trial of each case, he fled Boston and came to Los Angeles, California, where he assumed the name John Roselli. In an article from 2004, John Sanders tackled Ro Ro Johnny's narcotics charges. He wrote that after the death of his father, Filippo Sacco delivered milk to support his family. His decision to add a few extra stops on his schedule for a local drug dealer resulted in his arrest for delivering narcotics to a snitch. Ovid Damaris, drawing from his lengthy interviews with Jimmy the Weasel, gives another rendition in his last mafioso. He doesn't mention narcotics at all. He says, strapped for money, Sacco's new stepfather convinces him to burn down the family home. So they want that glorious insurance money, right? But after doing the dirty deed, Johnny's spooked. He's worried he's gonna get caught, so he skips town. Filippo, who was in the seventh grade, left home and ended up with Al Capone in Chicago, where he learned all phases of the crime business. Did you think of do? Biographer Lee Server also subscribed to the fire insurance scam angle, but stated that Johnny's arrest in May of 1923 was for burglary. Burglary. Someone allegedly gave him 50 bucks to buy them some booze, and when Johnny welched and pocketed the money, the guy turned him in. So his family paid something like $300 in bail, then Johnny vanished. Rapley and Becker wrote, he came among the young bloods who migrated west to join Capone's band, becoming 
a street thug, a rum runner, and a gunman for Al Capone in Prohibition Chicago. That's similar to what Ovid Damaris is selling, right? But there's a problem with this theory, and Lee Server unknowingly highlighted this in the timeline his research offers. So, let's embrace reality for a moment, shall we? Weigh the facts to test feasibility. Feasibility. In May of 1923, Johnny gets arrested. Post bond then, according to Server, he and his pal Tancredi Tortura go to Brooklyn and stay with Torturo's cousin for a few weeks. That puts us at at least the start of summer. It's going to be June of 1923. The server adds, sometime in late summer, putting us now at about August of 1923. The pair go to Buffalo, New York, where a bootlegger and nightclub operator named Mike Morrow takes the Two young drifters in. So Morrow supposedly hires Johnny in his speakeasy on Eagle Street. The kid has just turned 18. He's cleaning tables, pouring drinks, and he does this until his pal gets bored and wants to move on. Tortora got restless in Buffalo and heard about jobs on the Perry Marquette Railroad. So they apply and get hired as track hands. Now, if Johnny worked at Mike Morrow's speakeasy, even for a short amount of time, then it had to be at least late August or September before they started working on the railroad. Next server says, after a couple months of repairing damage to the tracks and clearing debris on the lines between Buffalo and Detroit, Johnny and his pal quit and traveled to Chicago, where Tortora's uncle Vincent Lamort lived on May Street. Now, the timeline, per Lee Server's account, has to be at at least November of 1923, and probably even late in that month. The only insight Johnny's FBI files offer on this period is that Johnny spent a few months in Chicago under unidentifiable employment. But they say this believing that he didn't land in Los Angeles until February of 1924. Other sources have stated he reached L.A. sooner. And according to Becker and Rapley, in the winter of 1923, with the heyday of the Capone mob still before it, Roselli's career with the nation's most notorious criminal gang was cut short. I'm not sure who, if anyone, in the Chicago outfit that Johnny Roselli met at the tail end of 1923 during his brief stay, right? I know he was affiliated with some members of the underworld, but I don't think he was actually tied up with anyone in the Chicago outfit. Folks seem to think it was Al Capone who immediately took him under his wing. He saw something magical, then whisked him off to California on a gangster mission. Uh, that's a little too Hollywood for me. According to Johnny's testimony at the Kefauver hearings in October of 1950, he didn't meet Al Capone until he came to Chicago for the Tony Dempsey rematch at Soldier Field on September 22nd of 1927. He took a train from California to Chicago specifically for that fight. And that's when he claims to have met Al Capone. Now, folks try to create a closeness between Roselli and Capone, and they do that by mentioning Al's visit to Los Angeles in December of that same year he met Johnny, 1927. When Johnny heard that Al had arrived in town, and it was no secret, the press and law enforcement and your average Joe all knew about it from the moment he set foot in the City of Angels. Johnny heard Al was staying at the Biltmore, and he went down to say hi. Al was down south at the racetracks in Mexico before he came to Los Angeles, and he only ended up spending one single day in L.A. before law enforcement sent him packing to the train station. But because of this brief, casual connection, folks seem to think Al and Johnny were tight. 
Whether or not Johnny was lying about how he came to meet Al, it should be noted that Capone wasn't running the show in Chicago in late 1923 during Johnny Roselli's visit. Johnny Torrio was. The federal files state, in 1924, Torrio was the victim of an ambush in which he nearly lost his life. He saw fit to retire and turn over his reins to Capone. Now, to correct this error in the federal files, yes, the feds make mistakes too, I'll point out that the assassination attempt on Johnny Torrio occurred in front of his Clyde Avenue apartment in late January of 1925, not 1924. Al took the reins shortly after Torrio's operation. But by then, Johnny had already started getting arrested in L.A. So, obviously, he didn't send him. While the idea of a young, tough, and handsome Johnny Roselli serving as Capone's missionary out west certainly makes for a very noir and cinematic angle, he is looking at you, kid. Highly doubtful. These claims that Johnny was a Capone gangster in his youth lose a hell of a lot of weight when you factor in this timeline. So Johnny spent weeks in Chicago, perhaps a month or maybe even a month and a half. But even if he had spent months there, that's still a mighty sh short slice of time and certainly not sufficient enough for a kid to establish any real or lasting ties with an underworld organization. And yet, and yet, crime writers still make the big and bold decree that Al Capone supposedly dispatched Johnny to California. Right. For craps and smiles, right? Let's go ahead and entertain that fantasy. If Al Capone did take a liking to Johnny, and if the young man did in fact have the backing of Johnny Torrio's organization and was sent to California to oversee Chicago's interests, then apparently the outfit didn't provide their new recruit with any bankroll or assistance. Johnny reached the City of Angels alone, broke and half dead. According to Rapley and Becker, survival was his main concern. He got to LA sick, penniless, and gaunt. So Johnny's choice of employers after hitting the coast should be the first indication he wasn't affiliated with the outfit. He came to work for an independent Italian rum runner without any known ties to Chicago. Someone who was never a made man in the local crime family or in any mafia organization. And that was Tony Cornero, who Rapley and Becker very inaccurately refer to as a mafioso. So Roselli and Cornero were taken in together in March of 1925 by the cops as murder suspects in the killing of Milton Farmer Page's bodyguard, Walter Hesketh. So sometime in 1924 or early 1925, Johnny started working for Tony Canero. During his early years in Los Angeles, authorities hauled him in often, but not always under the same name. He went by several aliases, including James Russo, Russo being his mother's maiden name, and the much more humorous Jimi Hendrix and John Stewart. His arrest record is actually very impressive. But after a huge liquor bust at sea in late 1926, Johnny Roselli lost his employer. Tony Cornero was indicted in late December of that year, but somehow managed to escape custody on his way to prison in April of 1927. He probably paid the cops off. Anyway, either way, Cornero fled the country, leaving Johnny all alone. All American mafioso claims that after Cornero's exit, Johnny ran to Chicago. And this is during that trip to see the Dempsey fight, Dempsey fight that I mentioned. Allegedly, during this visit, Al Capone suggests to Johnny, hey, you should go work for Jack Dregna. Apparently, according to Rapley and Becker, Al considered Jack a prospective partner on the West Coast. But here we run into another issue of who was running the show. Joe Artizone was the boss in LA at that time. Jack was likely his underboss, but because Artizone's name is never mentioned once in Rapley and Becker's book, it's safe to say they had no clue he was in charge. 
In their defense, they didn't have access to the federal files and the mob literature available to the public had not yet identified Joe Artizone as the boss in Los Angeles. So, something tells me the authors wholeheartedly fabricated this entire scene where Al tells Johnny, hey, go work for Jack. And that, unfortunately, is not the only instance in all America where Rapley and Becker completely make something up. Mm. Soup Nazi. Oh, soup for you, one year. How and when and why did Johnny Roselli come to work for Jack Dragna? Good question. Whatever the answers, an arrest six months before Johnny ever met Al Capone is certainly suggestive of a close tie between Roselli and the Los Angeles Brugade, considering Johnny was Italian. And this was during a period when it wasn't prevalent for non-Sicilians to be accepted among mafia ranks. He may have only been an associate at this time. This arrest happened in March of 1927. Officers nabbed Johnny in a basement bootlegging plant on North Broadway. And get this, newspapers described it as a cleverly concealed, electrically guarded plant in the floor of the bathroom. Ooh, watch out for the seat. <laughs> Hope you don't miss. So, Tony Bruno lived in that residence and Tony Bruno worked in Jack Dragon's crew. As author Bill Friedman rightly indicated, Roselli switched over to the booze smuggling operation of Jack Dragna. That is very true. And come 1930 and 1932, Johnny would be arrested again. And in each instant, he was arrested with Jack. According to Johnny's FBI files, the closest man to Roselli was Jack Dragna. All right, so... Johnny remained a loyal member of that family, the Los Angeles Brugade, until sometime in 1956. Per an alleged Roselli quote from the book The Last Mafioso by Ovid Damaris, years ago, Jimmy, it was a different ball game. Today, there's too much greed and jealousy. The greed and jealousy of little men. No vision, no imagination. That's why I got myself transferred when Jack died. I wasn't about to work with those assholes, DeSimone and Licata. No way. All right, so wrapping up this installment of A Dose of Truth, I'd like to swing the caveat that there are a lot of other misconceptions surrounding the life and crimes of John Roselli, one of them being his role in the extortion of the Hollywood movie o Studios, so I feel confident in saying his name will no doubt be popping up again in later episodes. Till then, don't believe everything you read, and remember... Just a spoonful of sugar helps the dose of truth go down. This is Dr. J. Michael Neota saying sayonara for now. Uh, next time, salute.